we're going to let people come in uh, for the next minute or two, and then we're going to uh, begin the webinar. Once again, we're letting people come in for a minute and we're going to get started very soon. Oh. We're going to get started in a minute here. It's good that happened then. So welcome to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. On the Park Bench presents conversations with thought leaders in new urbanism and allied fields, providing an opportunity for the audience to engage in real time. The webinar series is a platform for CNU members and like-minded people to engage, debate, and collaborate on the pressing issues related to urban places and people. Today we have Design for Adaptation, the Climate Challenge for New Urbanism, with Elizabeth Flater Zyberg and a discussion with interviewer Rick Cole. So share your thoughts on hashtag on the park bench, www.tinyurl.com slash OTPB feedback. I wanted to uh, remind everybody about CNU 30 in Oklahoma City coming up uh, uh, next year. Um, save the dates for uh, March 23rd through 26th. 2022, it's gonna be CNU's first in-person Congress since 2019. Very exciting, meet your colleagues, hear from people who are making a difference in urban design and development. Witness firsthand a city's renaissance, a city, Oklahoma City is, is doing so much and so many creative things that others can learn from. Learn more at cnu.org slash cnu30. And we've got a very exciting uh, show today uh, um, with um, very distinguished, a very distinguished panel. Uh, Elizabeth Plater Zyberg is uh, Malcolm Matheson, Distinguished Professor of Architecture and Director of the Master of Urban Design Program at the University of Miami. She is co-founder of CNU, co-founder and principal of DPZ Co-Design. She is author of Suburban Nation, a seminal planning book, and she is one of the most influential urban designers of our time. And Rick Cole is executive director of CNU. Rick is the former mayor of Pasadena, where he became one of the first US elected officials to embrace new urbanism. He also served as city manager of Azusa, Ventura, and Santa Monica, and he was deputy mayor of Los Angeles. I'm Rob Studeville, editor of CNU's Public Square and producer of this series. Today we're going to have a presentation by Liz, followed by a discussion with Rick, followed by Q&A from the audience. And um, uh, so please use the Q&A function of Zoom to ask questions as they occur to you. Once again, uh, this is a very important topic, how to help communities adapt to climate change. With that, I'm gonna pass this along to Liz to share her screen.
Welcome, Liz, and thank you very much for um, agreeing to talk about climate change. As you know, it is one of um, Congress for New Urbanism's three most important um, focuses, and we'll talk more about why that is after your presentation. Thank you, Rick, and thank you, Rob. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, uh, you know, this is a big topic, so I will have to admit that um, whittling it down to um, uh, the, the preparation for a discussion was not easy. And uh, some of this I will dash through, uh, but I felt it was important to provide um, the background um, for a clear discussion. And so uh, this is the table of contents. Um, I will not be reading the slides to you all, uh, but just giving some of the background information along the way. Um, you know, I tagged on the UN Climate Change Conference logo just to remind us that um, uh, just now there is a lot of discussion about this and um, uh, we're bound to be hearing some new uh, news uh, in the near future. So um, starting with um, what the, uh, you know, I'm just going to take you through a, a bunch of media because uh, the climate change discussion in public has been largely um, started with a kind of sensationalist approach to, um, uh, to the topic. Um, there are a lot of people who have um, attached themselves to the, um, to the picture. Um, uh, there's a great, uh, I think, belief in innovation that's being presented by many of the topics. Um, I think I must have skipped through Naomi Klein's book. Uh, there are other agendas that are being attached to it. There are people who are arguing back about um, uh, the technology and uh, the actions that are being proposed. But for the most part, um, it's all about um, reducing emissions and mitigation. And um, I think adaptation is really in our wheelhouse. And that's what I'd like to spend the most time on uh, before we get to see and you in the discussion. But um, you know, part of it is that um, uh, as various media for various audiences attempt to deal with this, um, the there are in fact solutions being sought um, and the electrification of everything recently in the Wall Street Journal, I think points to some of that approach. But so let's go back to the beginnings and say very quickly, what is it we're talking about, the science and what are the impacts? Um, the science is essentially looking back um, at the sources. Uh, it's, a, it's an action of discovery. Um, the impacts are, is, look, is about looking forward and thinking about what do we do? What are the innovations in creation? What kind of um, a, a creative activity is needed in order to address the impacts? Uh, and one addresses primarily uh, concerns of mitigation. Uh, most of the scientists are talking about uh, and trying to help us consider how to reduce uh, mitigation, but in fact, many are speaking to the fact that that takes a long time and we should be um, addressing adaptation immediately. Um, so we don't need, you don't need to hear about this. There's so many uh, sources that will tell you about um, why the globe is warming. Um, and there are various lists of impacts. Um, this is my list that takes it from um, the additional heat that's being generated and um, what that, how that heat is moving around the globe and having various impacts. And of course, when you look at these, you begin to understand that there are um, great geographical differences. And that's part of what makes it um, uh, difficult to discuss on any larger level. Um, uh, than let's say reducing emissions. So um, before getting on to a little bit about mitigation, um, I just wanted to show this diagram, which uh, came up in one of my courses and I thought um, is very interesting from the perspective that there are there is of course the long-term historical trajectory, but that magical line at 1950 that appears in all these increased population, increased energy use, increased water use, any number of things um, uh, really points to how recently we have become aware and 
um, that the word accelerating uh, is obviously um, something we need to be paying attention to. So uh, the very basics, two responses to climate change and notice not solutions, but responses. Um, mitigation uh, to which, uh, in which most of our sustainability activities um, uh, that we've been engaging since the 60s and 70s um, can address, but obviously not yet adequately. Uh, and this speaks to the sources, which, uh, and it's a universal response. Everyone can deal with uh, or address mitigation, which is exactly what's going on in the UN conference. Um, but adaptation, um, which speaks to resilience or responding in responding to impacts is really um, uh, very regional and very local. And that's part of the complication of discussing it or working on it uh, in any way together or collectively, um, which of course is important. So um, just to review, um, minimizing through mitigation, uh, universal actions for universal generator, generators, adaptation, regional and local actions um, for those impacts which are occurring locally. And there's still a great deal of uncertainty which um, um, call, uh, increases the difficulty of addressing it. Um, the chart on the right is something that um, we've developed at DPC that speaks to the fact that even as you develop tools, um, there's often a crossover from mitigation uh, to adaptation, or it may be the same tool that can deal with both. And um, that doesn't help uh, clarify, although it's good news. Um, so uh, a few slides on mitigation. Uh, note the 30 year lag time um, that any effect from changing our technology or behavior can have. And there are really two, those two aspects, technology and behavior are um, a kind of uh, an overview of what we can do in order to um, reduce the generators. Uh, draw down uh, now a much more complete website than that first book uh, is a great place to go learn more about this. Um, the sources are divided up into these categories, which you've seen before um, in terms of emission types. Um, again, uh, in each one of them, we can begin to think of the changes that could occur technologically um, or through behavior, uh, and sometimes both um, industry um, buildings. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, my. I'm just going to go back and show you one. My um, computer seems to be slipping through some slides. I wanted to show this one because Steve Muzon, our own uh, one of our CNU members, has produced um, this for the Wall Street Journal a while ago. So we're already working on this. Um, I would say that CNU is quite prominent um, in building design, transportation uh, changes, um, uh, and uh, even promoting. Uh, certain kinds of industrial production changes. Uh, the natural environment, which um, uh, we're hearing, we're beginning to hear uncertainty about whether this is really um, one of our uh, wonderful opportunities for absorption of emissions or whether it may be producing uh, more than we expected. Uh, we won't go there now. So on to adaptation. Um, a little bit more complicated. It's not uh, just two kinds of responses, but there's really a sequence that runs from um, defending um, a, certain con a certain place geographically against the impact, accommodating um, eventually, in some cases, retreating, and if there is a retreat, what might the cleanup be? And even the scientists will say, the sooner you start, the better. Um, this is a kind of graphic um, uh, presentation of the difference between the two, um, between mitigation and adaptation. And um, I think it's pretty obvious what the differences are. So I'll move on. Now, forgive me for this slide because uh, probably most of you can't read it. But what I wanted to point out, and I'll run my cursor through it, is that in the adaptation, um, there's a whole series of 
uh, variables to understand from chronic and catastrophic and each one, the public and private sectors have different roles to play. And each one of those um, has a series of sequential actions of defend, accommodate, retreat and clean up. And really the only reason I'm showing this is to say, I think that having some kind of structure to understand um, how all of this works together um, is important because otherwise just from uh, reading about it in the media, uh, it can be very confusing. And I think if we want to imagine how any one of us or how our organization deals with uh, any aspect of it, we need to understand where we are uh, within that structure. So using sea level rise at first uh, as an example, um, you can see a kind of sequence of defense accommodation, retreat, uh, and finally cleanup. Um, and uh, these are probably things that many of you have thought before, thought of before. Um, and just like um, mitigation, which speaks to um, types of sources, adaptation speaks to types of impact or impact vulnerability. Um, and once again, we can uh, divide it into infrastructure, buildings, natural environment, and um, a little bit different than mitigation, uh, regional networks. Um, this is the Bayonne Bridge in a sequence of photographs that shows the roadbed being raised, uh, not uh, only for size of ships, but anticipation of um, the water level rising. Um, that took me through too many, okay. So uh, infrastructure adaptation is generally public sector work. Um, it's long-term um, thinking. It's, you know, the window of change may be a hundred years. So uh, the investments might be rather large. Um, buildings, um, uh, although some are public sector, primarily private sector. And here we can begin to parse in terms of um, the type of owner or the type of investor, as well as the life of the investment. Um, uh, and uh, you can make your own um, uh, priorities in terms of a list like that. But uh, at some point, I think what this sets us up for is uh, where do we spend the money for adaptation um, uh, in this kind of situation? And sometimes the, the decisions might be made by the private sector without any attention to uh, larger shared concerns. Um, and likewise, um, adapting the natural environment, uh, much of it will be adapting on its own. Agriculture is a managed adaptation. Uh, and even now we are trying to um, uh, adapt um, things like corals um, uh, in a way that we, would, we haven't historically. Um, and then of course, uh, the larger patterns of um, either trying to save or um, set aside uh, whole uh, geographical areas of um, settlement or natural systems. Um, but always it comes, eventually it gets to the point of considering, considering it economically. Um, what is the, what's happening to the regional, regional economy? Um, is there a loss of employment? Uh, are there revenue losses for the city? Um, uh, and the municipalities. Uh, so another aspect of adaptation that's important to understand are the fact that there are differences between catastrophic and chronic impacts. Um, the catastrophic is usually an event, um, a storm surge or um, an unexpected huge flood. And um, in terms of the built environment, we're thinking of the occasional resilient recovery. Um, the chronic um, impact is an evolving condition. Um, it's rising groundwater, for instance, um, sunny day flooding as it's called in Miami Beach, uh, and will require or already has required permanent physical changes. Um, examples uh, of defending and fortifying uh, a chronic condition uh, can be seen already in Miami Beach where streets were raised in a particularly low area and um, pumps were installed. Um, what you see on the upper right 
um, is not the pump, but the generators that are kept above flood level. Um, the pumps are um, underground uh, and much larger. Defending and fortifying for catastrophic uh, events, uh, another Miami example, um, our, the Army Corps of Engineers has recently landed on us and said they have the solution. Um, that wall, which um, is pictured in a Miami Herald article, you'll, you might notice the tiny bit of graffiti um, that uh, whoever was putting that newspaper photograph together uh, put on the wall. Uh, it later disappeared in um, the electronic version of the paper, but I caught it on paper. And um, uh, a, interestingly enough, a developer's counter proposal, um, uh, which was made because of the prospect of, of the terrible impacts of that wall. But anyway, this is about um, a man-made mechanical, um, more often than not, uh, mechanical responses, um, although uh, there's more and more knowledge about the natural ones that could be used. Um, so that was about defense and fortification and moving on to accommodation. You can see one place which has been living with water um, literally for a long time, uh, Venice, um, uh, which accommodated for many years before its fortification and defense was uh, finally completed. Um, those gates um, uh, at the outer harbor uh, were recently com completed and at, uh, apparently functioned well during a high water event. Uh, and in other, we're quite used to um, uh, event designing for event resilience, um, catastrophic event resilience around the world. Um, uh, some quite old versions, such as the Paris uh, River Sandbanks, and then uh, some of the more modern ones from uh, shared and public spaces to buildings. Uh, but what about some of the other impacts? So uh, thank you to Martin Dryling uh, on the West Coast, who has done a lot of work on fires um, and likewise points out that they can be both catastrophic and uh, chronic and that actually um, there's a certain normalcy to fires um, and so there's a certain um, knowledge or predictability that we can work with. Um, slow slide. Sorry. Um, and he has uh, come up with uh, an approach to what might be called fire resistant urban design. Uh, and you see a page from the smart code module, um, which he produced um, to actually give instruction about that. Um, uh, but essentially uh, he's speaking that about normalizing fire um, in, in a sense, normalizing fire and climate factors to make them less severe, uh, but as well to understand that actually the location or the geography of where we build is important. Um, what is known out West as the wildland urban interface. Um, so that's a kind of accommodation to fire. Um, now, there is a whole series of other variables that complicate decision-making. Um, and uh, I think by now, in all cases, one understands that there's a, um, a great potential and likelihood, in fact, for triage. And how do we make those decisions? Um, so the three, have I missed them? Yes. Um, the three responses, or the three variables, the three main variables are geographic, economic, and political. Um, and I think you can understand the geographic from the um, flooding and fire perspective, the economic, um, always some kind of cost benefit analysis, and then the political, uh, which um, obviously can be a kind of wild card, but is essentially about how we invest uh, in the changes that need to be made. And so um, uh, we can begin to see the geography in a place like Miami-Dade County, uh, and understand how it might impact economic choices because of the location um, of certain, uh, uh, certain items that are important to the regional economy. Interestingly enough, at the beginning of these discussions, um, the public sector was very fearful of making these 
kinds of maps and they're not yet uh, finalized. You can see those were kind of committee drawings. Um, the economic factors, of course, are getting a lot of national attention. Um, how long can FEMA spend money on um, digging us out of floods or fires, um, I think is um, uh, clearly before us. Um, but the local factors are probably going to take us through, um, uh, are going to be prioritized or the first um, that we feel in terms of responding to impacts. And, you know, I think um, in many conditions, we look at urban decline uh, because of not being able to uh, respond completely um, to the impacts as they evolve or worsen. And we can look to the Rust Belt, uh, in fact, to understand uh, how urban decline occurs and um, the plummeting of values, the plummeting of um, uh, revenues. And um, so it really does raise a question. We have, we know, we have that experience. We know that uh, how that happens. So how should public policy respond to the private response of retreat? Um, because probably um, that's the order in which it will happen is that private decisions are made first out of fear um, or desire for what better and well-being. Um, and so setting the priorities for these um, decisions is very important. Um, uh, what are the high value public facilities that are needed, the infrastructure? Um, uh, how do we deal with the high value private areas? There's a very interesting um, ongoing uh, uh, situation evolving with condo consolidation um, in Miami, which is a very complex picture, legal picture. And um, that's one of the scenarios that needs to be studied. But obviously, um, uh, thinking about how do we let go of the lower value places first, perhaps, uh, maybe not. Uh, they are the voters, perhaps. Um, anyway, you can see from all of this kind of thinking that um, uh, we really need to figure out those scenarios. Uh, and the local political factors um, already, the kind of uh, difficulty for the politics of climate change adaptation is evident um, as communities start to plan for it. So this is a DPZ plan for a small community um, in which as with some of the public documents, uh, the county's documents, the euphemism of prosperity um, uh, is copiously used because there is a great um, fear and denial of the difficult actions that have to be taken, or at least to wanting to postpone them. And uh, an understanding that the coordination of public and private efforts is really unpre unprecedented and needs to be figured out. Um, the, for instance, uh, rebuilding seawalls, is it a public cost? Is it a private cost? How do you coordinate it? Um, you can see it gets complicated. Um, and the timing, of course, is important. Um, what's the private um, window, investment window that's um, uh, uh, maybe influential as opposed to the public one. Um, climate gentrification, you don't need to read all this. I just wanted to show you that internationally, um, there's a great concern and a lot of um, uh, research, which I think is calling us to attention more so than um, good solutions or uh, responses. Uh, and um, at the federal level, um, you can see that it starts getting complicated with um, uh, other agendas. So we've been through defense and fortification, uh, accommodation, retreat. Now we're on to retreat and um, the cleanup I think is pretty obvious so I won't be spending time on that. Um, but retreat might be called relocation. Uh, it's often called abandonment. I decided not to put that word up. Uh, but certainly people are speaking about climate migration. And um, this is the only adaptation action, which is in fact universal. Um, uh, mitigation is wholly universal. Um, and the only thing that might apply to everyone, and therefore I think offers an opportunity for CNU, but also maybe the only um, 
way that the federal government can uh, intercede productively is through um, uh, this understanding that at some point uh, it applies to all the impacts that we need to get out of harm's way. Uh, and already we can see um, we can see the discussion about people leaving places that are, uh, are no longer hospitable and um, uh, those places which are in fact inviting people uh, in um, because it would be a way to revive an economy. Uh, lots of hazard and retreat mapping going on. Um, uh, Matt Howard, who I think is at the University of Florida, has some uh, interesting statistics about how where people are leaving and going uh, just within the United States. So um, let's talk about retreat because I think this is where some of the scenario building still needs to be done and could be an opportunity for CNU. Um, and so uh, part of it from the private, to begin with the private sector is uh, issues of timing, um, the prods or drivers like insurance uh, rates rising and, um, and the financing of properties. Um, it, you can't get a mortgage if you don't have, can't get certain kinds of insurance. Um, uh, how does the devaluation of property because its life is shorter than we've ever considered um, affect uh, its purchasing and its long run viability? Um, maybe increased affordability. Maybe we can begin to think about real estate in terms of, um, uh, different ways, not ever, not constantly increasing, but um, depreciation like automobiles. Um, the public scenarios um, require really an understanding of um, what the impacts will be, what the ultimate capacity for defense, and and um, if there is a, a shrinkage um, scenario, how that's managed um, economically. So let me just keep going. Uh, but one thing to understand is that the funding sources are not coordinated. So um, currently there are four different funding sources for uh, let's say flooding buyouts. Um, I don't know if this would be um, the same for fire, for instance, whether the Army Corps of Engineers would get involved, but they all have different methods and different results. And those really need to be um, uh, coordinated to be effective. Um, not to forget that um, all of this may have a, a kind of um, creative um, financing approach, which I would be very interested in discussing uh, in the CNU conference, because um, although that's not uh, in a sense in our wheelhouse, um, we could have some influence over it and it could be very helpful in the long run. Um, but there are some interesting proposals being um, projected uh, uh, for the use of private capital in uh, redeveloping. So um, after uh, retreat, uh, because it's a coordinated effort at um, a response cannot be mustered, then perhaps private uh, redevelopment uh, mustering large amounts of capital could come in. Uh, or public capital, new development um, using um, public climate defense funding instead of um, the kind of short-term um, adaptation that might be occurring, especially in flood, flood zones or sea level rise zones, perhaps tying those to new investments um, could be very interesting. So what is CNU's role in adaptation in that in this complex picture I've just put in front of you. Well, you know, I think we've already started by laying out the principles in our various documents, the charter, the canons, um, many of the kind of tools um, that have been produced, tactical urbanism um, already mentions, um, uh, this kind of long-term change, lean urbanism, and of course our 2017 summit where we came together to discuss these things. Um, and these are the things we do. Um, we research, write, practice, we're activists, um, and not to be diminished, I think, is the kind of discussion and learning that goes on in the listserv. So um, with an apology to Lawrence, 
uh, for quoting him, but he often brings up the difficult, um, a difficult standard, a more difficult standard than others um, are using. And, you know, he's suggesting that our work with urban design is a kind of slow moving change compared to um, perhaps some of its increments um, that we could be working on. And Scott Bernstein's um, Center for Neighborhood Technology, which pointed out that um, the way we measure uh, effects needs to be, uh, is important and needs to be understood. Uh, Doug Kalbaugh's book, um, The Urban Fix, which um, speaks to um, tree planting um, as the closest thing to a silver bullet uh, response. And really just hot off the presses, um, Gabriel Talimenti's The Healthy City, um, which compares um, uh, cities of comparable populations, but of different um, urban type uh, and what the pandemic uh, statistics were in those cities. Um, very interesting, it's in Italian. We can't read it in English yet, but it's already generated a lot of attention. Um, and Jason King from Dover Cole, War Stories of Community Planning for Climate Change. Um, and then Harrison Fraker speaking to um, the environmental performance of public space and how um, we can improve our public spaces um, to deal with climate. The transect has proven to be um, very important because of its geographical foundation. Um, uh, in South Florida, it has directly influenced the first official climate action plan, taking a look at the eight different conditions, each one requiring a different response. Um, uh, and as well, of course, Martin Dryling's smart code module on fire mitigation. It's called the fire mitigation module, and there, there's the rub uh, about the use of these two words. Uh, and of course, ta tactical urbanism has been very important in the pandemic. Um, the kinds of uh, changes that were made to public spaces, um, which uh, indeed many of us hope will continue um, with a longer life. Um, Liz, we should probably get to discussion pretty soon. Thank you. Um, so uh, this was really the my last slide, which is to say that this is our expertise um, making change uh, and to use a social science um, trajectory of change from social marketing um, through facilitation to establishing, making new goals normative and perhaps even establishing regulations. I think we can look back at our experience um, in change making and imagine um, uh, perhaps try to set up the same kind of trajectory for um, working on adaptation. Thank you. So let's um, leave that slide up, um, Liz, for okay. a moment. All right. And good. As you referenced earlier in uh, your talk, uh, Glasgow um, is. Um, a gathering that's happening next week of people from all over the planet to address what uh, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is calling a planetary red alert. And so as executive director of the Congress for New Urbanism, this is really uh, timely to talk about how um, CNU is going to seize this opportunity to make an impact. And I know opportunity sounds strange, but it's both an opportunity and a responsibility of, of the Congress for New Urbanism based upon uh, the principles of the charter, uh, which 30 years ago enunciated that placeless sprawl, uh, economic seg and racial segregation, um, environmental devastation, and, and the loss of social fabric were one issue. So this is a planetary red alert. That means it's a Congress for New Urbanism red alert. And the board of, of the Congress for New Urbanism ha has voted that um, the year that we kick off uh, in March, when we gather together in Oklahoma City, will be a year focused on climate change and equity. Those are central planks of 
CNU's strategic plan to design for climate change and our prime directive around challenging exclusionary processes and practices, both within our own professions uh, and out there in the world. And so this is an opportunity and, and a responsibility for CNU to focus on what we can do. And, and this really is the beginning of a, of a major effort to focus our energies. Um, back in, uh, in 2017, um, the, uh, one of the things that came out of that was, um, I wanna get the exact uh, quote, the magnitude of climate change is even greater than that of sprawl and will call upon new urbanists and allies to step up their efforts to share best practices and collaborate across sectors. So um, uh, I, I'd like you to kind of address where we start, um, uh, Liz. What, what are the most important things to mobilize our membership, uh, our planners, our engineers, our architects, our elected officials, our developers, our, our financial folks, our, our academics? Where do they dig in uh, to really prepare CNU to make a measurable impact on the national conversation around climate change? Um, what a big challenge. I guess that's why you're asking the question, right? Exactly. Um, and so, you know, my inclination would be to parse it in some um, rational way according to our experience. And um, part of that was identifying what the problem is that we're trying to solve. It was, like you said, suburban sprawl. And in a way, um, we came up with one vision for that, the pedestrian-oriented, walkable, transit-friendly, compact community. And we've been working on making sure new places are that way, but also trying to help old places. Um, uh, maintain or increase those characteristics. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be that easy with climate change, um, except for one, the issue of um, retreating and receiving communities. And uh, so I suspect we probably should have a series of topics. And one of them might be um, uh, how to encourage uh, movement or mobility from community to community to get people out of harm's way or to help uh, communities in receiving, inviting and receiving um, uh, new, it's not just new people, but you need to be thinking in terms of employment, the amenities that are there and so on. Um, that's clearly within our wheelhouse. Um, and that touches upon um, the second theme of, of equity and the intersection between yes. climate change and equity. You, you, you um, referenced in one of your slides the, the reality of climate gentrification. If there are um, nice places, those places get bid up and become unaffordable, often to the residents who've been loyal to those places for decades. Similarly, if there are relatively few safe places, um, people uh, of means are going to be um, able to bid up um, though the prices in the places that are safe, which makes our responsibility to make many, many more places safe um, and safe and inclusive. Yes, and it, uh, of course, uh, we shouldn't forget that um, many of um, the less wealthy are living in less, less safe places already. Uh, in other words, that's it, a historical reality to deal with. Uh, but I think um, it may be about developing scenarios for these th uh, for these conditions, and in particular, um, uh, you know, there's the the short term of looking um, looking back and saying there uh, there's a lack of safety um, in this place where people are living now, and what do we do about that? And they don't have the resources to leave either um, uh, social or economic. Um, you know, the community becomes, localized community becomes very important, um, the less resources one has. And so um, that's one aspect of it. But I think the long, I think we can be providing some of the long-term um, uh, 
trajectories in order to preclude people from being left behind in unfortunate circumstances, which is the Rust Belt analogy. Um, and so that's already something that I think we could be developing, but I think we need to be doing that as we always have in partnership with other groups, in partnership with people who um, understand where finance is going. Um, because no matter what we learn about it, somebody else is thinking about, you know, is inventing new smoke and mirrors on Wall Street. Um, and that's kind of, that's missing in our, um, um, what do you call it, our cloud of organizations, I think. Uh, Daniel Church asks a question that's right on point here. Uh, understanding that there's still a great deal of uncertainty of where potential climate migrants, migrants will relocate to, and of course, um, parenthetically, some of that will be decided by politics. Um, what can cities that are assumed to be receiving cities, perhaps the Great Lakes or the Inland South, do to prepare for population growth while also working to do it sustainably? Um, that, and, and that would be a great, um, uh, maybe in the future, a great legacy charrette topic um, uh, for future CNU gatherings, because I think you're uh, talking about anything from the initial marketing to saying, what are, let's do the growth plans for this place ahead of time, uh, not one development at a time, but let's imagine uh, what the expansion over time with new neighborhoods, new um, transportation um, would be in one of these places, in, in other words. And that's very much something that uh, the CNU has experience with. Um, uh, so, you know, I think there's a kind of two or three step approach to developing those kinds of plans. And the first one, of course, is the intention, the understanding and the intention by the leadership of such a community, of such a city that um, this is really what they're aiming to do. I think we perhaps we have seen that in places like Carmel. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it strikes me that, um, again, uh, an opportunity and a responsibility for CNU to make um, an impact here. Um, we weren't around when really catastrophically stupid decisions were made about how to shape cities after World War II, um, in which giant freeways and giant infrastructure systems were imposed upon fine-grained neighborhoods uh, and urban renewal um, and highway relocation. Um, moved 3.6 million people uh, out, of, um, uh, out of the way in, in the name of progress. And so one of the things that CNU can do because we are here now and we are connected um, and we are mobilized is to stop some of these really um, catastrophically expensive and disruptive massive efforts um, to, to fortify uh, and to deny change versus um, more decentralized, more fine-grained, um, more organic solutions um, that respect the timeless ways of building. And it, it, I attempted to show some of that with the Army Corps of Engineers proposal for Miami's um, storm surge wall. Um, but so yes, that's absolutely true. And you know, I wonder if we shouldn't be um, trying to have our ear uh, to the ground um, it's not a wonder, we definitely should be for the current infrastructure bill that's coming through, because of course we know um, who's uh, uh, wired or ready to accept those kinds of funds for what kind of um, development. It's uh, even, uh, you know, as we speak, highways, the new highways are still um, an easy way to imagine that um, that kind of funding uh, should be spent. So, you know, I think that's, that could be another topic, Rick, that um, how to address the new infrastructure spending, um, sending it to the places that need it or um, to the types of uses that need it more so than what would be conventional. And, and every billion, and um, we're talking about multiple billions spent on urban freeway and highway expansion are billions that we won't have to um, 
devote to adaptation strategies for, for climate change. Uh, it's going in the wrong direction. And yet um, uh, that, you know, that particularly in the bipartisan bill, there's, there's a significant amount of money set aside for, for uh, highway expansion. Uh, even as we, we find it difficult to, to repair um, what we have and repair the damage of, of what was created. And Daigle um, offers, I think, an intriguing counterpoint. Um, and I think uh, 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 an equally significant challenge. She says the red alerts of everyday Americans are terribly far from those of climate change. They care about the cost of gas, because there's no transit available in vast swaths of America, the rise in consumer prices, the lack of affordable health care, child and elder care, et cetera. CNU focuses on the region, the city, the neighborhood, the lot and block. Does it make sense to express and share our specific goals and objectives, all complete, compact, connected, complex, convivial, a lot of C's there, and which can be channeled locally to appropriate leadership? In other words, that, that overlap between mitigation and adaptation, the things that, um, that are, are not just good for um, uh, preparing for, for catastrophic climate change in the future, but make life better right now? Well, uh, you know, obviously the answer is yes. Um, but, um, you know, I think we need to understand um, that there is the kind of immediate, uh, I don't even know what I'm gonna be doing in five years. Uh, and I'm worried about my children in school right now. Um, uh, and as you said, gas prices, uh, when there's no public transit available, uh, which hits everybody. Um, and so uh, there are, um, and it probably uh, that's where the localism of adaptation can be the most, um, have the most beneficial impact. Um, because I think if we um, look at everything that we're about to spend money on uh, publicly or even uh, private investments uh, locally and say, this needs to be seen through an um, a, the lens of climate change, uh, while it may not be diverted to be thinking only about the long term, um, what is it about climate change that can and uh, and thinking about adaptation for the long term that can um, be more beneficial immediately? Uh, and so that that timing becomes um, that time frame becomes very important, and especially when dealing with the with the private impact. Um, but if you look back at where we started, you know, when we started talking about suburban sprawl, um, the public was totally um, unconcerned, unaware. Um, and it really was only when uh, the alternatives started appearing and that people understood they could start making decisions that um, uh, changes started to happen. And I think we might look ahead to that kind of trajectory if we can start showing the plans that we're working on or that our local civic activism um, uh, might produce something that could be um, shown as being part of uh, um, an, an adaptation approach as well as currently beneficial. Um, each one of us could be having an effect um, in our own communities. And certainly those of us who produce um, the, the traffic planning or the legal documents or the, um, uh, the urban designs uh, could keep this lens in front of the public, um, in front of our audience to say, um, you know, we're helping, we're doing what needs to be done right now, but there's a longer picture that we're looking at too, because ultimately, that's the greatest sustainability if you're making investments in something that will have a long life. Uh, excellent point. And, and, and it speaks to another of the conclusions in 2017, which I'm reading now. We have neither the time nor the resources to tackle climate change, racial and social equity, and public health as separate challenges. We must aim for solutions that address all three. That, that speaks to the responsibility um, of, of uh, connecting the dots. And by its nature, CNU is interdisciplinary, right? We're, we're neither in one region nor in one profession. Um, we, we include people who, who think holistically. 
even though urban design and how we build places is the center of who we are and what we practice, um, we have a wide range of people who, who think um, both across uh, divides, but also um, in short, medium, and long-term uh, ways, which is in, in many ways the, the essence of sustainability and resilience. A couple of great questions. I don't know if we'll have much time to um, do them justice, uh, but I want to at least um, note them. Uh, how do we discourage growth in areas that have underlying long-term climate change? For example, the Phoenix metro area with future challenges of extreme heat and not enough water, contrary to economic expansion and social marketing underway. That comes from Bonnie Richardson. One of the things I think that will run smack into that is um, insurance. That's probably gonna, gonna um, be a, a problem for builders before some of the, the symptoms of climate change really um, uh, come into play. So it may be difficult to finance uh, some of the development in places like that. And then Ryan Stevenson says, uh, it seems like coming from some urbanists, uh, new urbanism isn't married to any particular urban form or typology, which is counterintuitive. I think the person is saying, you know, we believe in the whole transect that there's appropriate kind of development across, across the spectrum. One would expect new urbanism to espouse cities. I think clearly we have, um, we've always said that they are more, they are the most environmentally sustainable uh, per capita. Um, field urbanism are newly adapted typologies, maybe even concessions. Do we, this is a fancy word, defenestrate, in other words, sh throw out the window urbanism today. Important to adaptation is adopting the pulsing paradigm and homeopathetic planning versus steady state. Uh, okay, so a complicated uh, and, and, and thoughtful challenge. I'm going to give you a an opportunity, Liz, um, for kind of a final word, not necessarily um, responding to either of those two questions. But again, what is the way forward over the next year to fully mobilize um, new urbanists around this challenge, this opportunity, and this responsibility? Well, um, Rick, two things, if I may. Uh, one, um, you know, the urban less urban question that was brought up, um, you know, it may be just about reformatting some of the highest density uh, or the most crowded um, uh, density of our cities to make them greener and healthier. Um, and I think that's where Talia Venti's book is kind of pushing us. It's not about um, uh, pushing everything down the transect as much as um, uh, it, really learning from uh, that kind of data to how to perhaps reformat cities. But I think in terms of CNU, um, maybe one of the things we can do is develop, and some of these questions, I think, in a sense, develop the topics and say, uh, let's parse this into very, the topics that interest people to explore further so that some of the um, research, discussion, um, writing, and so on can be um, uh, more focused and more coordinated among the people who, uh, according to their interests, and then bring that back uh, in some kind of um, um, a list of responses or scenarios for responses that uh, could advance the discussion. Because I do think uh, it's not an overnight thing, and we're going to, as we always do, learn from each other. Um, in having these kinds of interactions and the Congress is a great place to, um, to enable that. Absolutely, and there'll be sessions at the Congress um, in March in Oklahoma City that will kick off this year of focus on climate change and equity. Um, new urbanists opportunity and responsibility to respond to this planetary red alert, um, an opportunity for all of us uh, to enlist ourselves in making an impact um, climate change is not something that is coming. Climate change is here. And it's our responsibility to make an impact, um, not just to mitigate, but to adapt to that reality. So I hope we'll see you in um, Oklahoma City. And I look forward to working with all of you over the next um, 18 months as we focus on climate change and equity. Rob, turn it over to you. And thank you very much, Liz, for an absolutely stellar uh, presentation about the complexity and the depth of the challenge uh, and some preliminary thoughts about 
how we tackle it. Rob? Well, you all have, have said it all. <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to thank everybody who, uh, uh, all the participants, all the listeners, all the people who ask questions as well. And uh, thank you, Liz, uh, especially for helping us to get our arms around this very important to topic that we're going to be talking a lot more about in this coming year. Uh, so stay tuned for more um, on the park bench uh, uh, um, episodes or uh, webinars uh, coming up in November and December and uh, go to the CMU website to find out more about that. And once again, uh, thank you everybody and have a great day. Uh, I should mention the, the video will be posted on the CMU website uh, probably tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Rob.